Hey, good morning. Yes, it is. It's Thursday, April 18th. Pretty busy day yesterday. You know, we, we knocked out a lot of stuff early, but the bigger part of my day was fixing fats. What do they say? The grass is always greener on the other side. And my girls are not hungry. I've got a couple of juvenile delinquents that decided they're going to test the fence. And I went to, because we had a friend of ours put one back in for us. I went and looked and my fencer was unplugged. I have an electric fencer around the whole property as a backup. So with that fencer being off, there were a lot of fence on the ground that needed new posts, new this, new that. So I spent most of yesterday doing that. But today's video is going to be on, I I got your question work and play about, you know, 20 units per day. What kind of a populated area would you have to be in? And we'll go into that and more along that same topic. So stay tuned. This should be interesting. <laughs> So welcome back. My name is Eric, if you didn't already know it, and this is the weekday show, Monday through Friday. Today's Thursday. We upload videos on a daily basis. I've got one that's already done that i got to upload this morning, and that is on your two short carburetors. Just kind of more, this, this is more for you do-it-yourselfer guys, in that knowing what is a serviceable and what is a non-serviceable carburetor and why they're coming through non-serviceable and that's because the EPA does not want anyone monkeying with those carburetors to cause more pollution per se right but it's on that and today's topic we're going to be talking about how many units because <laughs> i never looked at it as units okay if you're in business as a small engine repair shop okay the goal always has been at least as far as i know is to have something that's being billable per hour taking place for the full time that you're there right and if you're working monday through friday you know eight hours a day you need eight billable hours per mechanic per day to stay profitable and when I say billable hours if you have floor planning and you have stuff coming in by crates if you're keeping your employee busy your mechanic busy doing something during the slower periods we talked about that yesterday that's fine but when it comes right down to it if if there isn't something going on in that shop that's not a billable hour you're losing money and it depends on how big a shop you're running okay some shops are run with three or four mechanics others like ours Claude is the mechanic you know, I do mechanical work, but his job is is the mechanic. So in our shop, we have to have something in front of him for the full time that he's there. I never looked at how many units is that going to take. I know being in the business for quite some time that it's harder now to get billable hours than it used to be. And I know what you're going to say is, why? Well, because before with billable hours, you had customers that were willing to pay for a complete rebuild, a tear down, new rings, new piston, 
you know, knew anything it needed. Because it was refreshed and it was just like new. You could never get it new again, but it was just like new. And for like the, the saws and everything, we used to get the jug kits. It came with the, the jug, the piston, the rings. So all the upper part was all brand new. And the customer was willing to pay to have that done because at that point, the stuff wasn't cheap to start with, okay? But it was cheaper to have it well maintained than it was to step out and buy new. And a lot of your older guys still feel that way. That they'd rather have their old errands, you know, or old, old John Deere fixed versus going out and buying a brand new one because they don't make them like they used to. Problem with that is these companies wised up and they quit making parts for those older machines, thus outdating them and no parts to be had, right? So that brings us to modern day, modern day machines. And it's come to, and that's why I th call it the throwaway generation. Because you're basically trying to decide, is it worth fixing or not? Yay or nay? That is your biggest goal, right? And you have to, if you're, if you're running your shop right, then you need to be fair with the customer. And when I say fair with the customer, you need to keep the repairs at a comfort level that they're comfortable with. And that means if, a, if they can go buy a brand new one for like 30, 40 bucks more, I guarantee you they are not going to be happy with you because you quote unquote fixed their unit. I know this. It's from experience. So when a machine comes in, we do a quick assessment on it. And I know most of you guys out there, whether you're working on cars, snowmobiles, four-wheelers, you guys that are repair guys are doing the same thing on a daily basis. You're looking at something and saying, is it fixable, is it not, and then... Is it, if it is fixable, is it worth fixing? And most mechanics in repair shops, they don't even want to look at the weed eaters because the weed eaters are about a 50-50. Flip your quarter, right? Chainsaws are a little better. But the stuff that I'm seeing coming out today is not quality. It's not made to last. If you can get a saw, like even the steels, the MS 170s, 180s, depending on how much wood you cut with them. I have the farm here, so I, I've i got the steels in the Husqvarna's. The Husqvarna's I've got in the, the bigger, bigger saws. You know, and I got the farm boss, the 290 steel that I still use. But they weren't made to do a lot, you know, a little bit of trimming around here and there, but not 40 cords a year. No. They're just a go out on a weekend warrior type thing. There are equivalent saws in the Pro Series that last a lot longer, but you're going to be paying twice to three times the cost, right? And for your typical homeowner is not worth the cost because well, they could buy a saw like that you know if they're going to pay what is it they're almost 300 bucks down so if they're going to pay 900 for a pro series they could replace that one saw the homeowners you know three years in a row for what it costs you know for that pro series so in the end these companies know it, okay? 
So you have to say yay or nay when it comes to the door. And that's critical. And we never used to charge a diagnostic fee. And we were just taking up a lot of our time on crap. People would find stuff on the side of the road, I think, and bring it to us and say, just get it running for me, you know, and let me know when, you, when it's ready to go. And most of that stuff was coming up as a nay. So we weren't making any money on it because I always felt, you know, bad for the customer. I can't charge you if I didn't fix it. And Claude kind of wised up to that and said, look, you know, when they go to work, they don't work for free and neither do we. We have to have money coming into the shop. So if one of us is doing an assessment, a diagnostic on something, we need to have some kind of revenue for our time. We can't work for free. And if we're doing diagnostic half of our day in a four hour day, you're spending four hours doing diagnostics and you don't charge for it. Now you don't have that mechanic hourly rate, do you? So, and as we've talked to in prior videos, when it comes to the diagnostic, if I decide that it's worth fixing, if I have good compression and fire, I drop the diagnostic fee and I just start from when I originally started on it to when I end at the shop rate of 55 an hour. They're not going to get charged a diagnostic and an hour. No. If I deem it worth fixing within the first half hour, and you should be able to do that within the first 10, 15 minutes, then the diagnostic is not charged. We just go strictly to hourly rate. But the question that you had work and play was, how many units does it take? Or how big a population does it take to get 20 units, 20 push mowers through the door a day? And you were talking about hiring someone to do the secretarial part, do the check-ins, do the parts lookups and keep you with parts. I would be hard pressed to do 20 push mowers in one day. I'll be honest with you. You know, even in a 10 hour day, you're going to spend over half an hour. If you're doing it right, closer to an hour on each push mower. And that means the decks clean, good, everything checked, compression, everything. Blade sharpened and replaced if it need be. So if you're talking a single mechanic, I don't think you could do 20 a day. Maybe. Depends on how many hours you're willing to put in. I would say you could probably, if things were in that bad of shape, the push mowers, you might be able to get 10, 12 a day. Because you're not going to be working on something steady. You have lunch and you have your coffee breaks and you're talking to customers. and So when it comes to how close a population, how big of a population would it take to get 20 a day? I don't think you need to be a million. I don't think you'd even need to be 500,000. You need to be somewhere in town. See, we do maybe 25, 30 push mowers a year. But it's our location, okay? And not our shop location. It's the servicing area that we're in. We're pretty spread out. Most people have got one to two acres of grass that they're cutting for a yard. Some more than that. So that's where the bulk of our work comes from, is out in the country. And those are going to be riders. 
And if they have a push mower, it's to do trim around the house. But I've noticed a trend where they're going to, instead of dealing with gas anymore, they're going to the uh, battery-powered trimmers for weed, weed eating. And I can see those are going to be the ones that go towards the battery operated for the uh, push mowing around the bushes and everything else. But that's where we see the push mowers. Now, if you focus in town, in town you're going to see a lot more push mowers because the yards are a lot smaller, right? It's not economical or feasible for a a homeowner in in the village or in the town or in the populated area to have a 60 and zero turn that by the time they get it started up they do a couple circles it's not even warmed up yet and they're shutting it off because their yard's done no they're going to go buy a push mower and that's where I think these eco push mowers are going to come into play with more and more. I did some checking on that, by the way. Because I like to know what's out there against me as a gas garage, right? And I found that you could get the Eco, the battery-powered push mowers, for right around 300 bucks and up. But the ones that were 300 didn't come with the battery or the charger. So if you're considering buying one of these, make sure before you order it off Amazon or, or wherever that you're at least getting the charger and the battery. Now, I don't know why they would sell them separately in the beginning because from what I understand, the batteries are outlasting the push mowers. If anything, it's the other way around. The batteries are what's going. And the cost of the battery is probably half. And there's different levels of batteries, right? Like on my 20-volt dual set, you know, they got the low-profile lithium battery, and then we have the big battery that will last longer and give actually more power. And then you have different chargers. Some for quick charge and the other ones for a slower over a longer period. All those costs have to be figured in. But I figured it out looking at the different ones for a standard 21 inch with a bagger. All right. And the charger and the battery. It's a 56 volt battery. You're looking at right around a grand. All right. Thousand dollars. Sounds like quite a bit. But if you're buying today's push more and you might get three years out of it, you're paying $200 for that, right? Minimum. But if you're buying one with a bagger, we're going to say $300. And probably higher than that. <clears throat> have that serviced every year there's 50 bucks so there's another 150 so now you've got 450 in it for the three years you've owned it and now it has no compression so you got to buy another one I don't have any numbers yet because they haven't been out long enough of how long these ecos are standing up to the pressures of you know mowing with a grass mower with a gas mower only time will tell but I can see the homeowner leaning that way as technology catches up and the big thing with battery operated stuff it's not that we're all against it it's you shouldn't force anything onto anybody to start with. It's called capitalism. If they're reasonably priced and they're a worthwhile investment, people will buy it. 
right? But if you have the, the government trying to force you into it, the government has never made a good decision in their life, all right? They don't work for a living. They just hang out and have little meetings and behind door sessions and this and that crap all up. I think Elon Musk is, is going in the right direction with the stuff. You have all these eco-friendly vehicles sitting on lots. All these eco-friendly lawn and garden, zero turns, all the other ones sitting on lots. Because people are not willing to buy them because they're not economical yet. But we were all standoffish with the DeWalt 20 volts, right? Until the technology caught up with them. And now we use them every day, right? Instead of using air or electric. We still use air on more blades. And when tearing down a tractor, a lot of the hard to do, we put the PV blaster on it and let it sit. But that air, half inch will take it off a lot faster than a half inch battery operated. Got more torque. So I'm going to start wrapping this up. What it boils down to work and play for us anyways. And it's not so much how many units. It's how many hours are billable per mechanic a day. And if you have a mechanic that's working an eight-hour shift, you need eight hours of billable work coming out. And I know of some shops, and I don't agree with it, that they have... She, they have like a time clock and a customer with the the unit so when the mechanic goes over to grab that chainsaw they're logged you know they're starting the clock and they may start working on that for so long and then they need parts so they grab the other one and sometimes they'll have two or three units being billed per hour by one mechanic and I don't look at that as being fair to the customer. If you're not physically working on it, why are you billing for it? You know, if you've got a, a unit come in and you have to wait for parts, even if the parts are locally sourced and they're, they're going to bring them over later today, you need to clock that out and start on another one and clock a new one in and go as far as you can with that one and then clock out. And then go and grab another one. There should be never a reason why there's three units being built for the same hour by one mechanic. One exception. And that is if you're doing servicing on lawnmowers. And what we do is a lot of times we'll bring the first one in. Start draining the oil. Do the fuel filter, air filter and that. And then jump over onto the second one. Start that oil running. Because what takes the most time, a lot of times with lawnmower riders, is just getting the oil to, to drain out. It's like watching paint dry. I look, at, I, I look less at how many units per day I have to have. And I look more at how many billable hours do I have for that day. And location, location, location. For most small engine repair shops, usually March through October. March is going to be their, where they start their push. But once you have so many lawnmowers serviced, I mean, the idea that people are going to keep bringing you lawnmowers 20 a day Even if you knocked them out in the same day, how long are people going to want to wait? Are they going to want to wait 30 days to have their unit serviced? And it's seasonal. So like up here where we get snow, you're not going to get the, the push mowers throughout the winter months. All that stuff has to be factored in. My job is to somehow keep enough work coming into the shop 
to have billable hours per mechanic per day, 365 days a year. That's my goal. Not always feasible, but that's always been the goal, is to try to keep the shop going with work. And we like the bigger jobs during the winter months where we're doing tractor overhauls, transmissions, clutches, and all that. Because that tractor will give us a lot of times billable hours for a week or two while we're working on it. Where a riding lawnmower may only give us an hour to two hours and they're out the door. So on that note, I hope that kind of answers your question. You know, you guys have a great Thursday. We'll see you here bright and early, you know, tomorrow morning. And again, thanks so much for watching and supporting the channel. So we'll catch you later.